verse by verse study in the book of Mark right now. And uh, we are all the way up to chapter 5, praise the Lord. We started out pretty slow, but we're moving along now, and we're going to look at quite a few verses here today as we're looking at Mark. Uh, Jesus has been teaching quite a bit in the last chapter, chapter 4, um, probably more than any other chapter within the book of Mark. Uh, we see some of the teachings of Jesus where, you know, the vast majority of the book of Mark is dealing with the actions of Jesus, as we've talked about quite a bit. And so today we're going to see some action, and, uh, you know, this this story here in the book of Mark here today, probably the more, one of the more action-packed and incredible stories that we find within the book of Mark. And so um, we're starting out here in, in chapter 5, verse 1 this morning, and I entitled the message, Dwelling Among the Tombs, because what we find today is that de- demoniac. You remember that Jesus and his disciples are coming across, going over the, the um, Sea of Galilee, Going to the other side, they had some weather on the way over. The boat almost sank, but now they've made it to the other side. And lo and behold, a demoniac comes out to greet them. Uh, And so we'll start there with verse 1. If you follow along with me, he says, Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the uh, boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you, implore you by God that you do not tor- uh, torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. We'll stop there. Heavenly Father, We thank you for your word. We thank you for this very powerful picture of just what Satan would like to do in all of our lives. Lord, we ask that you would help us to understand it in a way that maybe we've never seen before. Lord, that we would apply it in our lives and that, Lord, we would be able to communicate this to the people that we know around us so that they might not uh, be involved in the things that Satan has them involved in. We thank you for these things and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we'll read the rest of it as we go. It's a little bit of a lengthy story. It's one of those stories you don't want to really break up into two sermons, uh, I don't think. And so, uh, just looking at the beginning of it, this very powerful uh, story here, isn't it? Coming across that sea, uh, encountering uh, a demon, uh, a man that is possessed by a demon. And actually, we find that there are two men. In the other Gospels, we find there was actually another guy in the same situation coming down to greet Jesus. Now, in the book of Mark, we have found already there have been several occasions where Jesus has cast out demons out of people. And, you know, in today's society, this is one of those things where, uh, you know, people will point and say, you look, the Bible is full of mythology It's, uh, you know, there are no demons. People don't get possessed by demons anymore. And this is just an example of that. Well, what I would would encourage you to think about as we talk about demons here this morning is to not think of them in the light of what you've seen on movies and what you've seen on television, what you've read in books and all those kind of things, you know, uh, heads spinning around and vomiting green stuff out and all that kind of stuff. Uh, You know, we often kind of, Uh, think about demon possession in those terms. And if somebody's not doing that kind of stuff, then, you know, it's not happening. What I would encourage you to think about is, 
is what we see today and the parallels that we see within the life of this man. The self-destructive nature of what's going on in this man's life. The uncleanness. And understand that, you know, if you're not a child of God, if you don't have the Holy Spirit of God possessing your life, you know, really, all people out there have, to some degree, some kind of control of Satan over their life. Some more than others. Uh, some are, are completely given over to the power of Satan, and their lives are being destroyed as, a, as, a, um, as an example of that. But um, often there is, there's just a lot of parallels that we see in the lives of people today. And, you know, I, wanted to, I, I really debated whether I was going to show these, these pictures or not. Uh, but I decided to show them uh, because when I was out in Eureka, California, I was, uh, we were very involved in, in uh, outreach to the homeless. We were very involved in outreach to men that were on the street and men that were really on skid row and, and then some. Uh, we were involved because the, um, my assistant pastor was the director of the rescue mission down on Skid Row. And, uh, and so I would go down there from time to time every week uh, and teach the men that were in the program down there. And I would also go down at night and preach to the guys that were coming in for the free meal at night and doing those kind of things. And so I ran into a lot of these guys. You know, and, and I saw within their lives a lot of parallels of what we see right here. Men whose lives are so destroyed by Satan Men whose lives have been so given over to the works of the flesh that they have no control whatsoever of their lives anymore. And, you know, uh, in in just watching uh, what was going on in their lives, their inability to to cope with society, uh, inability to hold a job, inability to, uh, you know, cope with society in any way. And they were driven out into the streets. They were driven out into the tombs. They were driven out into uh, a world of just not being able to cope with society at all because of the stronghold that Satan had in their lives. Now, the pictures of the men that I've shown you here this morning are are men in that place. And you talk about unclean spirits. All the pictures that I've shown you are men that have, uh, have molested children repeatedly. Men that have raped women with force and violence. And, you know, their lives are, are so filled with evil that they can't be around other people. They cannot be around society because Satan has that kind of stronghold in their life. Now, I'm not saying that these men are possessed by Satan in the way that this man was. But certainly you can see within their lives that Satan has a stronghold on their lives. And there is aspects of their lives that that certainly Satan's evil power is controlling them and making them do things that they wouldn't normally do. But because their lives are so given over, they really don't have the ability to, to stay away from that. Now, if you look in the book of, of Romans, here in Romans chapter 1, we find that there's a progression in the life of every person on this planet. As you begin to say, there is no God, or you begin to say, well, maybe there is a God, but I'm not going to worship Him. I'm not going to give Him glory. Within this passage, we see a progression until God gives that person over to a debased mind and, and, and allows that person to go after those passions and, and it completely destroys them. Here you see, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, uh, (laughs) maliciousness. Was that what it was? Yes. (laughs) Don't click yet. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithful, uh, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. Now, that fits the description of many people that are able to cope with society, right? You know, they've come to a place where, I don't believe in God, I'm not going to glorify God, and, uh, you know, their lives have become, you know, you see those kind of works of the flesh within their lives. That doesn't mean they're demon-possessed, though. It seems that there's, a, there's another 
a whole other level to where someone is so given over to those things that Satan is allowed to just control their entire lives. And their head is not spinning around and they're not puking up green stuff uh, and their eyes aren't you know, flying out of their heads and all that kind of weird stuff that you see in movies. But you can see the evil that is just coming forth from their lives. And no one is able to tame them. Uh, you know, people try, they put them into institutions and they zap their brain with electricity and they fill them full of drugs and they put them into a stupor. But once those drugs wear off, once that, those other things wear off, they're untamable. They're untamable. Until God is able to change their lives completely as he did in this li- man's life, they are ruthless and they cause serious destruction in the lives of other people as well. Well, as we go back over this and look at a couple of things, I first want you to see the shackles and the chains that are on this man. That's all that we as human beings can offer people that, whose lives are controlled by Satan. People that are in bondage to their own flesh, people that are in bondage to their own sinful nature and allowing Satan to control them, all we can offer is shackles and chains uh, and drugs now, today. Uh, but... Jesus is the one that can clothe them and set them in their right mind and deliver them from the power of Satan. And that's exactly what we see happening in the life of this man at the end of the story. Now again, we want to look at these demons, uh, you know, these demon-possessed men. Matthew tells us again that there are two demon-possessed men coming down. And often, you know, the, the Gospels are, are telling different aspects of the story. You wouldn't expect two guys, unless they were really trying to make up a story, to have the exact same story. If they had the exact same story, then you'd say, well, these guys just copied each other. They plagiarized off of each other. But you see that these two writers are seeing it from a different perspective. Obviously, Mark is taking Peter's account. And so Peter was seeing what was happening, maybe he just saw that there was one guy talking the most, and the other guy was just kind of in the background where Matthew says, hey, there were two guys coming running at us. And I remember it very clearly. There were two guys running after us. But it doesn't matter. It's not a contradiction. It's just another way of, of seeing the story uh, from the perspective of the disciples. And so do, two demon-possessed men, or ones, met him coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce. Exceedingly fierce. Think about that. So that no one might pass that way. Nobody was coming around that area that lived there because, hey, those guys up there in the tombs, man, they'll wreck your world. They'll, they'll, they'll beat you up. They'll, you know, just stay away from those people. And, uh, you know, so we have, and behold, they cried out saying, what have we to do with you, Jesus, son of God? Have you come, out, come here to torment us before the time? Very interesting what we see spoken by demons. As Jesus comes into their area, they say some very interesting things, don't they? Are you coming here to torment us before the time? It's not time for you to be here yet, is what they're saying. They know that at some point, God is going to judge them. They know that their end. They know because of their rejection of God and because they sided with Satan at some point in the distant past, that they are going to be judged someday and they're going to be thrown into the abyss with Satan, into the lake of fire with Satan. And they want to know, hey, aren't you early? I think there are some other things that are supposed to happen. They understand Scripture. They understand uh, way better than we do that uh, there are some things that are going to happen and then they will be thrown into that pit. You know, within the Old Testament... The Jews, the rabbis, because of the way the the Old Testament is written, it seems like there's going to be a Messiah coming and, uh, and he's going to be this meek and mild servant. But then it seems like there's another Messiah coming that's going to be a reigning king and he's going to come in power. And they believed at some point, some of them, that there's actually two Messiahs that were going to come because they couldn't put together the two. Why is there a picture of a Messiah as a servant and why is there one as a reigning king? The demons understood that. They they understood these things. And so they want to know, aren't you early? 
Aren't you, are you going to torment us before the time that you're supposed to torment us and throw us into that pit? And a little bit later on, we'll see in Luke that they actually say, don't throw us into the abyss. Don't throw us into that abyss yet. We don't want to go yet. That's amazing. Well, again, shackles and chains. A legion of demons. Quite a, quite a day for these disciples, don't you think? I mean, here Jesus says, hey, let's, let's take a boat ride across the lake over there. Go to the other side. All right, let's go. Sounds like fun. Half, halfway across, Jesus is in the back sleeping on a pillow, and a storm comes along and almost sinks him. And they, they wake him up saying, hey, we're going to perish. Don't you even care? We're going to die here. And they wake Jesus up. Well, after that all happens, they pull up to the shore there, and a, a legion of demons comes after him. It's not a good day for the disciples. But what I want you to see here is they made it to the other side. And you recall, as we looked at that story last week, Jesus told them, hey, we're going to the other side. But it was their lack of faith, or really the fact they didn't have any faith, that caused them to be fearful. Am I going to make it through this storm? No, I think I'm going to perish. I'm going down, my ship is sinking in this storm, and Jesus doesn't even care. God doesn't even care. He's sleeping somewhere. He doesn't even care about my situation. But it's worthy of noting, here in the very first of this chapter, they made it. They made it to the other side. And I just encourage you again, along with that story that we looked at last week, that when Jesus is in your boat, you're going to make it. You're going to make it to the other side. Here's another time that we can look and, and say, Jesus said they were going to make it, and they made it. They made it to the other side of that lake without going under. Well, one of the things we want to look at here, again in Luke, we have another parallel passage of, of this, the situation that's going on here. We find that this man that is the, the primary speaker to Jesus had had demons a long time and put on no clothes, nor stayed in a house, but among the tombs. He didn't have a home. He was a social outcast. He couldn't have a home. He couldn't hold a job. He couldn't do any of those things because of the power of Satan at work in his life. And again, I have to say, you have to see the parallels in the lives of so many that are out there, that are just so controlled by their, their earthly desires and their passions, that it ruins them. The works of the flesh at work in your life, if you do not control them, they will control you. And they will ruin you. They will bring you to destruction. And we see that in the lives of so many people today. I saw it out in Eureka. Uh, you know, Eureka was a, a town that just had a lot of drugs. And, uh, and the people were just, I mean, entire generations of families were just destroyed in, in, under the grip of, the, of that uh, crystal meth and uh, methamphetamines and, and marijuana and all that stuff. Their lives were destroyed as a result of it. Children and grandchildren hooked on that stuff. It destroyed entire generations of people. But again, this guy is in this place for a long time, and he, he's not even wearing clothes. Just the basic necessities just don't even become necessary any longer. He has this unclean spirit, and he's driven to perversity, living among the tombs. Well, again, what we see here, a little bit later, I beseech you, don't torment me. You know, it's funny that Satan doesn't give the same uh, courtesy <laughs> to his, his uh, subjects that are under his control. Here he is tormenting this poor man for a long time with legions, a legion of demons tormenting this poor man. Jesus comes along, oh, don't torment me. It just shows you what a jerk Satan is. It really does. You know, and someday we're going to look down on him and we're going to say, is this the guy? Is this the guy that's been tormenting us all this time? This little punk right here? And that's exactly what he is. He's a toothless tiger. He's a little punk. And you see him right there. Oh, don't torment me. He can dish it out, but he can't take it, can he? But he's going to get his in the end. Trust me on that one. All right, they begged him that they would not command him to go into the abyss. Again, they know their end. 
They know what their end will be. Satan knows his end. And the only thing he can do up until that end is to scar and maim and destroy the ones who carry the image of the one that's going to destroy him. And that's his game. That's his gig. I know what my end is, and as long as I'm here, I'm going to just give it to man because he bears the image of the one who's going to kick my head in one of these days. And so that's what he's doing. And he will do it to the extent you'll let him. I guess is a good way of looking at it. To the extent that you will let him, he will control your life and he will destroy your life. And I really see within this, and the main thing I want you to see today is that you see what Satan is trying to do to this man. You see what he is doing to this man. That's what he wants to do to each one of us because we bear the image of God. We bear the image of God. And he wants to destroy us as a result of that. All right, so unclean and untamable is what you see in this guy. And, you know, from my experiences and just dealing with those guys that are out there on the streets, um, just the uncleanness, you know, that's, that's a part of it. Just the, the inability to take care of basic needs. Um, but, you know, also the, the spiritual uncleanness is, is more at, at work here. Spiritual uncleanness. But you see the uncontrollable nature of this guy. In verse 3 it says, He was dwelling among the tombs and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones." Just untamable, uncontrollable rage and, and, and just, oh man, it's awful just to think about this. It's interesting that he was cutting himself with stones. You know, as our society becomes progressively, uh, you know, godless, and as, as our children, as our uh, teenagers are getting further and further into demonic activity, and uh, being more and more controlled by secular humanism. This cutting thing is coming back. It's quite amazing that we see it's a phenomenon among uh, many teens across the country. Just this weird desire and need to cut themselves over and over and over again. It's, it's just a, an amazing thing that we see it right here in God's Word. Destruction. Destruction of the image of God. And so, within that, I think we understand that Satan in the Bible is referred to as the destroyer. He is a destroyer. He's a a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. I'm going to quote that in a few minutes here. Um, Thinking about, (laughs) this is a a quote from a a famous um, poet of the 1980s. Um, thinking about, you know, just what a, what a great time Satan offers us, doesn't he? Boy, he's just got so much fun for us. He says here, they say there's a heaven for those who will wait. Some say it's better, but I say it ain't. I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints. The sinners are much more fun. Billy Joel. He's singing about uh, trying to seduce a, a young Catholic girl there in that song. And he's trying to get her to come down out of her high tower and everything. But you know, it's the the message of the world, isn't it? Come with me, Satan playing his little pipe. Uh, I will bring you fulfillment. I will bring you joy. I will bring you, you know, the, the fulfillment of all your desires. You know, come on, follow me. Don't... Stay there and and follow God. Don't stay and and, and follow the Lord. I've got much more fun things for you to enjoy. And he blows that little pipe, and many follow him, don't they? Many follow him. Our flesh says, yes, that does sound good to me. And just like in the Garden of Eden, Satan there saying, well, you know, doesn't this look good to you? Doesn't this look like it's going to fulfill everything that you want? 
It's going to fulfill that deepest need within your life. But God's words, oh well, did God really say that? Don't worry about what God's word says. You just take a little bite here and it's going to take care of you. It's going to make you feel good. And you chomp into that thing and you very quickly begin to learn that uh, stepping over into Satan's camp is going to keep you there a lot longer than you thought you were going to be there. And it's going to take a whole lot more from you than you thought it was going to take. He's going to make you pay a lot more than you thought you were going to pay early on as he begins to control your life because of those, those fleshly desires that he is meeting on a temporary basis. Well, that's the world. Again, it's the destroyer. Satan wants to destroy. Robertson's Uh, quote on this uh, particular guy hanging out in the tombs. He says, he roamed at will like a lion in the jungle. This demon-possessed man. Just waiting for somebody to come along so he could pounce on him. And it's really just the, the exact image that we see of Satan himself. Just waiting for somebody to come along unaware so that he can pounce on you. And you see that very clearly in 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And he devoured these two gentlemen in the tombs, didn't he? He devoured them completely. He devoured them completely. Now, Christians cannot be demon-possessed. I will say that right off the bat, uh, The one that is in you is greater than the one that is in the world. There are many verses that we could talk about to say that, you know, Satan is is not going to be able to share time with the Holy Spirit. You know, an unclean spirit is not going to be able to uh, share time with the Holy Spirit in this temple. And we're assured of that. But certainly Satan can, uh, you know, trap us. And he can get us to veer off the, the path that God has us on. And, you know, it, it only takes a, a few minutes in, in our lives to, to just take our eyes off the prize, take our eyes off the path that God wants us on, uh, just to kind of look over there and indulge in those lustly flesh uh, things. And, and before we know it, we're in bondage to our flesh again. We're in bondage to our flesh. And, and so we need to be very careful of those things because it's very true. Satan is a roaring lion. He's just looking around for some Christian that's not paying attention. Most of the world is, is not paying attention in the first place because they don't really believe that there's a Satan out there. They don't believe that there's a demon out there. They don't believe there's a destroyer out there until it's too late, until they come to the place of destruction in their own life and then allow the Holy Spirit to, to point that out to them. But for Christians, we need to be very wary of these things. There's a spiritual realm out there. It's very real. It's just as real as the stage I'm standing upon today. And we need to be uh, very, very sober-minded, as it says here. Watchful of that adversary. Now, does that mean that we should be looking for demons on every doorknob? And, uh, you, know, you know, that whole thing. We can go in the... In, the, in a whole wrong direction when it comes to demonology. We can become obsessed with, um, you know, demons coming out of my television set and, and all that stuff. We just need to, to keep in mind what it says in Philippians, you know, that uh, whatever things are pure, whatever things are uh, praiseworthy, of virtue, you know, those kind of things. Think on these things, sober-minded, um, Live your life in a circumspect way, keeping your head on a swivel, just looking out. But that doesn't mean we become obsessed with the demonology. <coughs> all right, well, moving on here, what do you get when all those things get, uh, the, the, the pigs get possessed? The De- deviled ham, of course. That's an old joke. Uh, you get to hear that at least once in your life. I'm sorry, I know, it's, it's shameless. Deviled ham, or the first... Case of suicide, maybe. Maybe that's a little bit better. I don't know. These are, these are not my jokes. I'm, I'm just, you know, 
I'm not taking responsibility for these jokes. These are just pastors I've heard tell them in the past. So I'm just repeating them. Uh, anyway. So anyway, we find them saying, you know, Jesus says, come out of them. Come out of the man. In verse 9 he says, then he asked him, what is your name? He answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. Now Legion, uh, the word Legion there, Roman legions had up to 6,000 soldiers in them. That doesn't necessarily mean that this man had 6,000 demons within him. Uh, He just says we are many. And so it's just an idea that there are many demons within him. But uh, it is interesting that he uses the word legion because there are 6,000 in that, um, at, at that time. Verse 10 also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. And then again, we have from the other passages, don't send us into the abyss for sure. Let us stay around here. We like it here. We like it here. We're over here in the... In the um, Gentile part of the world here. There's lots of uh, worship of false idols and images and we're just having a good time over here. Don't send us out of this country. Uh, we, we want to stay here. Let us go into the pigs, he says. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. All the demons begged him. There's a lot of begging going on in this story. Saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. And once Jesus gave them permission Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Now, you ask the question, why would Jesus allow the demons to go into them? I have no idea. I have no idea. I don't don't think that we're meant to know exactly why the, the herd of swine was chosen by Jesus. Uh, why, didn't Je- why didn't Jesus just cast the demons out, you know, into uh, space somewhere? I don't know. Why did he destroy them? I don't know. Why did he cast them? I don't know. <clears throat> but the one thing I want you to see here is the power that is being displayed. The power of Satan uh, at work in, in a life. One man or two men, if you want to look at it, because the other guy that was there, were thrown out into the tombs and they, they, they couldn't live their lives around other people and they were cutting themselves and all the things that they were doing. But when that demonic force was manifested in 2,000 pigs, it made those pigs run down a hill violently and drown themselves into the sea. There's a lot of power there. Again, the spiritual world is, is very real. It's very real. Now, as we get into the next section here, we find him sitting at the feet of Jesus, is what um, Luke tells us. He's not only sitting and clothed in his right mind, he's sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind. And I just love that picture there. And so, let's just read verse 14 through the, the rest of the verses there. So those who fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what, was, what, was, what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and, he had, the, and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. It's a beautiful end to the story here. A life that is completely in bondage, completely controlled by the power of Satan, a power that could drown 2,000 pigs into, a, into the lake. What a scene. 
coming across, seeing, knowing these guys. Man, watch out for those guys. Don't anybody go up there by those tombs because these guys will kill you. Stay away from these guys. The townsfolk hear the story of what has happened. They can't believe it. They come out to see it for themselves. They look down in the lake. 2,000 bloated pigs just bobbing up and down in the lake there. What a scene. And then they see the man who nobody can control. Man, we had to chain that guy. We had to wrap him up with shackles and chain him down, and even that didn't hold him. And there he is. He's got clothes on now. And he's not that crazy guy we used to see. He's not that insane maniac that used to maim and rape and molest and and hassle people all the time. He's in his right mind. He's, he's, He's okay. He's... He's right again. What a scene. What a scene it is. Sitting at the feet of Jesus. Sitting, clothed, and in his right mind. It's the picture we see. It's the picture we see when Jesus is able to get a hold of our lives. When we turn from our wicked ways. When we turn from the the desires of our own flesh. And the desires to just fulfill and take care of number one. We come to that place of realizing I'm a sinner and I am in need of salvation and I see Jesus as my Savior. And I come to that place and I bow my knee and I say, forgive me of my sins. Come in, dwell in me, possess me, Holy Spirit. Take over my life. I've wrecked my life. I've done nothing but damage to people I know and love. I've done nothing but harm I can't do anything right on my own. Lord, take over my life. Take my life and make me whole. Make me into the person that you want me to be. Mold me, shape me into the image of your son, Jesus. And he says, okay. And he comes in and he begins to do that healing work. He begins to do that restorative, regenerative work in our lives. And people start looking at us and go, Whoa, what's happened? What's happened to you? You're totally different. What, what's going on in your life now? And you're able to start telling them about the wonderful things, the great things that God has done in your life, the compassion that he's had upon your life. And it's a great testimony. This guy really can be seen as the very first missionary that Jesus ever sent out. You know, that's what he is, Really? He didn't go to seminary. He don't, didn't go to Bible college. He didn't sit under the teaching of Jesus for years and years. He says, I want to go with you, Jesus. And he said, no, you stay here. You go back and tell your friends what God has done in your life. You go back and, and show those people back there that knew you as a crazy maniac. You show them what God has done in your life and you be a testimony. And that's what he did. He was the very first missionary in that Gentile world over there on the other side of the Jordan River. And there is evidence that, that many people heard about Jesus from his ministry over there. We don't know that for sure, but there is a little bit of evidence. We won't go into that today. But he's clothed in his right mind, and I, I just love that. I, you know, I've seen that. There was a guy out in uh, California that was coming to our church for the last year I was there. And the very first time I saw him, he had, um, he had basically died. He was out shooting up drugs, drinking, and he overdosed. Uh, second time he had overdosed. And they took him to the hospital and brought him back to life, uh, revived him, actually, and, uh, and then put him in detox and... And they told him, you know, you got to do something with your life here. This is the second time this has happened, and uh, and you're gonna you're gonna die the next time. There's this is probably the last time this you'll ever get this lucky. And so he checked himself into the rescue mission and became a part of the program. And I saw him that Thursday morning. He got in there on Monday, I think. And there he was, just this wretched-looking guy. And I came in to teach the Bible study on Thursday morning and, and I looked over and I said, oh, we got some new guys here. Hey, what's your name, you know? And I start talking to him and, and he just said, 
man, I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing here. And he, he, just, he was just bewildered. He just had this look of, of a man who Satan had just destroyed his entire life and he'd been given a second chance and, and he wanted me to pray for him and, and uh, he, had, he knew that God had saved him for some purpose. He said, you know, I, I died on Friday night. I died and, and I don't know why God would allow me to be revived like that, but I, I've got I to gotta figure it out. And he goes, would you help me? And so he started coming to our church, and I mean, within three months, this guy was so miraculously changed. He was greeting and ushering, and I mean, he was just so on fire for the Lord, and still is today, because God had done such a miraculous work in his life. It was incredible what God did in his life. You know that God still does those kind of things today. These kind of things are still going on today. But you know, we now are the people that are making it across that lake. We are the hands and the feet of Jesus now. We are the ones that are going to those tombs. We are the ones that are going out into those places where people are dwelling that are ravaged by the power of Satan. And we need to bring that message so that they too can come to a place of repentance. Come to a place of being restored. Well... Wrapping it up here, there are people here that are begging Jesus to leave. Get out of here. We don't want you here. You know, the cares of this world, the desires for other things, and the deceitfulness of riches are far more important than what just happened here with this poor man. You killed our pigs. (laughs) You killed our pigs. We don't want you here. Get out of here. They couldn't see the incredible salvation that has been brought to their shores because of the material things that were going on. Hey, we don't want you here. Get out of here. They were begging him, pleading with him. Go away. We don't want you here. And you know, Jesus won't stay where he's not welcome. If we push him away, if we say, I don't want you here, get away from me. I don't care what you have to offer. Yeah, you say you bring salvation. I know all that. I don't care. I want to be on my own. I don't need you. The Holy Spirit will not force himself upon you. He will go away. Well, here in the life of this man, he begs him to go with him. Please let me go with you. I want to be with you. And we don't have the time to go through the story today. I was going to turn you back to Luke uh, chapter 7 that deals with that woman who was anointing Jesus' feet with the oil. And, uh, you know, she was a woman that had been forgiven much. And it was shown in her life that she was forgiven much because of how much she loved Jesus. As she brings this very expensive oil and anoints him with that oil. And she was there just at his feet, crying and weeping at his feet. And the Pharisees looked on and said, (laughs) He has no idea what kind of woman this is. We know what kind of woman this is, but she had been delivered. She had been delivered of her sinful life. It could have been one of the women that Jesus had uh, delivered from many demons. Uh, Some think it might have been Mary Magdalene, but uh, probably not. But there were many that Jesus had delivered from the power of Satan and brought them to a place of sitting at his feet, weeping, weeping, because of the joy, and because of the sense of forgiveness, because of the sense of how much they had been given, how much of they had been forgiven. And as a result, their heart was full of love for Jesus. You know, I think it's very telling how much someone loves Jesus, or someone, how much someone uh, has a, a sense of what they've been forgiven of, because it, it's worked out in how they live their lives to serve the Lord. How much their lives are now devoted to sitting at His feet and serving Him and, and taking care of whatever need. They're looking for a need. How can I serve Jesus more? How can I be more devoted to Him? How can I sacrifice more oil for Him? When we 
come and, and we don't have any sense that I need to do anything, don't have any sense that I need to go out and reach out to people, uh, it really kind of shows how much we realize of the own, our own forgiveness. There's not a whole lot of forgiveness there because there's not a whole lot of love going out in return. This man was sitting there begging Jesus, can I go with you? I just want to be with you. And it's so true, you know, when we have a touch from Jesus, uh, we just want to be with him at all times. But Jesus says, no, there's work to be done. We as Christians, we, we want to go to heaven. Well, I can't wait for the rapture to happen. Come on. We're just waiting. Jesus says, hey, I'll let you know when the rapture is going to happen. It'll just be a very quick thing. Uh, but in the meantime, you've got some work to do down there. Occupy till I come. You got some work to do down there. At this time, in this part of the world that we're in, we're it. We are the voice. We're the, we're the salt. We're the light in this time. And Jesus says, go back to your friends. Go back to those people that knew you before. Go back and tell them what great things God has done in your life. Go back and tell them about the compassion that Jesus has shown in your life. And really, that's all the training you need. If you have a sense of what He's forgiven you of, if you have a sense of the compassion that He's had upon your life, if you've had a sense of of that forgiveness, then you've got all the evangelistic training you need. You know, you can go out there and you... You run into people, hey, what about this, you know, what about this, what about, you know, all this stuff in the Bible and all these contradictions and uh, all that stuff. Hey, let me just tell you what God has done in my life. I was once blind, but now I see. I was once a sinner and now, you know, I'm still a sinner. (laughs) But I'm forgiven. I've been forgiven of those sins. He's had compassion upon me. <clears throat> and, and really, that's, that's all you need. You can study and you can learn more, but that's it right there. Jesus has saved me, and he can save you as well. Amen? Well, I'm just going to close with this today. Um, Matthew 7 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. These are the words of Jesus. Beware of false prophets, he adds, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Watch out. Be sober, be vigilant. There are ravenous wolves out there that want to tell you there's a a funner way to go. There's a, a, a nicer way to go. There's a more fulfilling way to go. This road that you're on is hard and God doesn't want you to have any fun. But you take this other route and it's so much more fun. There are Pied Pipers out there playing the, the flute that Satan has been playing for all of human history and has led many away, has led them into very destructive lifestyles, has led them into places where they're completely consumed by the power of the flesh and now the only route, the only way that they can make a living or find a living is to dwell in the tombs, to dwell on the streets, to dwell on Skid Row, because that's the only place that society will let them dwell. Well, I think just having compassion on those people is, is a key. You know, it's very hard to, to be around those, those kind of people. But when you do come in contact with them, have compassion on them. Understanding that Satan is tormenting them. Satan is destroying their lives. It's very easy to write somebody off like that and to say, ooh, I don't want to have anything to do with that person. I had a man that had come to our church for a little while, a sex offender, um, dwelling in the tombs out there. And this guy, uh, I saw him at Applebee's one day. And it was after church, and I was, you know, dressed in 
church clothes somewhat, as much as I get dressed up in church clothes. And uh, here we are, we're going in to have a nice meal after church at Applebee's. And this guy had come out of the swamp behind Applebee's where he's living. And he came up and he saw me and, and I saw him and, and I mean, he was just awful looking. Filthy, dirty, nasty clothes. And he came up and he wanted to give me a hug. <laughs> And I had the moment of, oh my, I don't want to hug this guy. But I did, I gave him that hug, you know. And sometimes it's very unpleasant, because he stunk to high heaven. He reeked. But they need to be shown that compassion. They need that human touch. They need to know that people still love them. And that there's still a forgiveness out there for them. Amen? Heavenly Father, we we do thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for your truth. Lord, we ask that you would place a compassion in our hearts. Lord, for, for people that we know that are under the control of Satan like this. Lord, that you would help us to not be so hard hearted and unloving as to turn away from those who are are so tormented and so in the grip of Satan. Lord, give us a heart for the people in this community that are dwelling in the tombs, that are dwelling in the swamps and dwelling on the streets that are in bondage. Lord, give us the boldness to go to them and speak to them the words of truth as Jesus spoke to this man. Lord, we thank you for these things. Lord, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.